Live from London, it's Plank of the Week with Mike Graham. Good evening and welcome to Plank of the Week. It's Friday night on Talk TV. I'm Mike Graham and have we got one heck of a show for you. There's been an awful lot of plankery around, including, of course, uh, the Tory party trying to find themselves a new leader. Uh, nobody wanted to do it, so they're not going to be in it this week. I'm afraid I'm going to tell you that right now. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel of beautiful people with which to choose who should win it this week. Uh, we've got Alex Phillips from Crosstalk. We've got Peter Bletchley uh, from Crime Suspect. We've got commentator Candice Holdsworth and we've got Steve Denyer from Virgin Radio. Welcome uh, to all of you. This is what we're fighting for. It is, of course, the one and only plank of the week. Let's get straight to it, uh, because, Alex, you're going to kick us off with some, a musical round. As yeah, no, this is uh, the black cellist who performed at Meghan and Harry's wedding, who has now sort of celebrated the world over for being black and a cellist. Right, of um, And uh, he has recently done is Desert Island Discs well? at the grand old age of 24. Yeah. You know, because you need veterans in their profession yes. to tell us all about their long lives mm. and the, the tracks that mark their years. Um, and one track that certainly doesn't mark his years, because he hates it, is uh, Rule Britannia. Yeah. Because apparently well, would, the line that Britons must never be slaves offends him to the bone so much so mm. that one last night of the proms he felt uncomfortable and had to leave during it. And so he would had rather... To leave. it. Yeah, I know. I mean, talk about uncomfortable listening. I'm sure learning to play the cello for the first five years was a dream to people's ears. Yeah, I would imagine playing the cello is quite uncomfortable because it's like it's up here and sort of down there, isn't it? It's quite I mean, difficult. my problem with all of this is, first of all, Brits saying we're not going to be slaves. Surely that's a good thing. Are we supposed to say, yeah, no, right. come on, enslave us? That's great. Also, this is apparently based upon Alfred the Great, who did with the Vikings yes. enslave us. The words of the original poem come from that period right. of history. Now, also, and this whole idea well. that, you know, getting upset by the word slave, there's actual slavery going on in the world. Perhaps campaign of slavery on going on in London. I mean, all you've got to do is go yeah. to Mayfair and check out what's going on in the basement of some of those big multi-million pound mansions occupied by a lot right. of people from Saudi Arabia. And you've I'm fairly Filipinos certain that he probably loved that track the same as everybody else loves that track because it's great, isn't it? It's mm. full of bombast and pride and it's just a real sort of Actually proud pleaser and arouser. Actually makes you feel rather proud to be yeah. British. I'm sure he loved it along well, with everybody else until some diversity officer said you're not supposed to like it. It made mm. a headline and now he's adopted the opinion. Right. Grow let's, up. Let's have a look because we've got, I think, a little clip. Roll Britannia, Britannia rolls the waves. Britons always, always, always will pay reparations. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, is he happy with that now? I think he'd like, that, like that. He'd like that, wouldn't he? Yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah. It's not quite as melodious, I have to say. But, I mean, you know, um, it's got a Good certain try. charm to it, and it might pass all the diversity tests. I think so. Yeah. But I find it so sad because I think his view is very typical of his generation. I yes. just think that they think anything is offensive and therefore it must be removed. Whereas well, they I don't think, think at all. They just copy someone who says that. I think so. It's very conformist and very conventional. Whereas I think previous generations would just be like, well, everyone can have their say. And even yes. if it gets a bit raucous, that's fine. I'm surprised he said it actually. I'm quite surprised that he had that reaction. Oh, yeah. When he was on a BBC show, don't you think they'd have cast the line out to reel it in from him? But before he, he goes with, um, on air, there'd be some producer going, What do you think about Rule How is he with Can Wagner? We talk about that? Does he like Wagner? Do you know, he should get, get involved you know, with the French national anthem. That is some tough talking. That is some tough talking stuff. But yeah. I mean, Wagner's music was famously liked by Hitler, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah. presumably yeah. he's not supposed to like that either. Is he? I mean, if he goes back through the canons of classical music, I'm sure he's going to find all sorts of unsavoury, oh, really? uh, yeah. historic views expressed. But why trouble yourself so but that, much? I mean, now we know why and Harry and Meghan picked him for the wedding, don't we? Because oh, obviously yeah. he, was, he was passed through the woke brigade test oh, yeah, to see so. whether he'd be OK. So he might not, you know, suddenly launch into a rendition of rule Britannia in the middle of the wedding service. But I think it's so important to challenge their views on this. Yeah, I don't think they're exposed to anything else. I think no. this is all they hear and they don't even think there is another view mm. on it. No, exactly. Or that they, it's valid. And everything that is of the past is wrong in some way. And yes. it somehow arrived at in the wrong way and was paid for by slave trades and all sorts of other nonsense, you know, which they come up with. Also, the National Trust this year. Why why should one person's synthetic offence, because that's what it is, it's made up. I don't think he actually is there shedding a tear and tossing and turning and, no. and worrying about the word slave in rural Britannia. Why should that then dictate the rest of the country's enjoyment yeah. of a patriotic song? Well, this is the, it's not about this you, is the, mate. This is the young generation of today, isn't it? They want everybody else to be banned from looking at something that upsets them. 
that's what they want to do. It's ridiculous. And it means culture becomes very bland. It does. And but we're not having it here on Planking It's always the, the people dripping with privilege. That guy has probably never had a hard day's work no. in his life. I'm sure, sure he practices his cello quite well. But he's not exactly... You know, if you go down to the local Weatherspoons and speak anyone, to a 24-year-old there and say, does Royal Britannia offend you? It won't. Listen, if anyone played cello in my school, they'd have been beaten up. Anyway, uh, Peter, <laughs> over to you. One of the greatest things throughout the railway stations yes. in recent years is the installation of pianos. Very good idea. Mm. And there's an organ at London Bridge, not so far from mm. here. Yeah. And I love it. If I've yes. got a bit of time to spare, listen to some wonderfully talented person tinkering yes. your ivories. Yes, lovely. Love it. Brendan Kavanagh yeah. is such a fella. What a great guy. Yeah, he plays a bit of boogie-woogie, yeah. a bit of honky-tonk, yeah. you know, for free, entertaining passers-by. Yeah. But he's got a mate who, not surprisingly, films him when he's playing the piano and will film any audience He's got reaction. millions of people watching it on YouTube as yeah, well. Yeah, so it's a good good thing to do. You know, yeah. He can promote himself, any on yeah. social media and a yeah. website, I'm and sure. And Britain. And all of that. Yeah. Absolutely. Until just a few short days ago, along pop a bunch of people holding Chinese flags, mm. proudly giving yes. them a wave, and they take exception to being filmed. So they challenge said pianist mm. and say, you can't film me. Well, he was busy tinkering the ivories anyway, <laughs> but you can't film me. This is all wrong. They've come from China. Exactly right. The most autocratic yeah. nation on earth right. to complain about somebody <laughs> filming them on their phone when they're in a public in space. In a public space. We've got the clip, so let's have a look at the altercation that took place. This is all right, we're protecting, and that's it. But what right? I don't understand. Image right. You're I'm free, really we're, sorry, we're on a schedule but, here. So, that's, me too, but we're in a free country, mate. That's true, we're you're in a free country. We're in communist China now, you know. Oh, I'm sorry, this is reasons now. We have no, we're not in communist China, we're in a free no, country. No, 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 I mean, I mean he should be hero of the week. could be woke. I thought that was banned in China. Maybe that's why they've come over here to get all woke yeah, all over our country. That's a racist country, thing to say. Because they can't do it at home. I think he was very measured, very yes. calm, dealt with the situation extremely well. I doubt I'd have been that that, that kind of polished, yes. really, because TikTok is a Chinese thing. It is, right? Yeah. So I think I'd have been very tempted to tell them to TikTok off. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> also, I don't show, uh, see them asking permission for everybody else that happens to be walking through St Pancras Station while they're filming their little skits, whatever it is. But this guy seems to think that you can come to Britain and you can demand that nobody uh, can film you on the basis that you've got a piece of paper which says that they can't do it. I mean, it's absolutely mad. Now, I picked this story up at the beginning of the week uh, and I had um, young Brendan on my show. So let's have a look at that. They wanted complete privacy in a station where there was thousands of people and, uh, you know, that everyone's there filming and uh, they want complete privacy. They don't want anyone filming them. They don't want to be known. And they were going around waving these yellow Chinese anti-disclosure things. Right. And <laughs> they said it's an extremely <laughs> sensitive issue. The guy is very, very sensitive. I mean, for goodness sake, now he's a YouTube star. Right. <laughs> Some research has been done into this kind of shady organisation that they seem to be attached to. They said they were working for some tourism company, right? But one of the women in the scene uh, has been pictured inside the House of Commons with Jeremy Hunt. Were the Chinese uh, the Chancellor? Uh, were the sir? Chinese people playing chopsticks? Uh, they were not, but thank you for asking. Uh, Candice, it sounds <laughs> no, like a good time to pass it on to you <laughs> yeah. uh, with your suggestion. For yeah, well, so we're kind of going from high <laughs> art to Royal Mail. Yes. Who have been annoying everyone. Well, they haven't been annoying anyone. Their regulator, Ofcom, yes. has been proposing all these things because their services become very inefficient and outdated, apparently. Yes. So one proposal... Well, they spent all their money on lawyers, haven't they, the post office? <laughs> so they haven't got any left. Well, this royal mail. Yeah, no, same thing. I, <laughs> I don't believe that it's all been broken up and it's different. Oh, really? I oh, believe okay. it all to be the same crowd of absolute idiots running a business which used to be really good and is now crap. But it's, it's in so many different areas. I mean, this is one of my points that I wanted to make. So one of the proposals that was put forward is that they should ditch Saturday Post, yes. which would be really dis disastrous for a lot of businesses, yeah. especially publishers who right. rely on it. And also, it's just like a less... It, I mean, it's a less efficient service. Yeah. And I feel like we've just gotten so used to that in our private and public yeah. sectors, where everything is just 
more oh, or you less. you can't do that anymore, so we're just not going to do it. No, well, I mean, it's water, it's electricity, it's the trains. Mm. We're just getting used to yeah. it but, now. Okay, can, I, can I cast your mind back to uh, 2007? I was helping... Uh, no, I wasn't helping. I was actually filming the campaigns for the Welsh Assembly election, working for various broadcasters in Wales. Oh, yeah. And I happened to follow Nigel Farage on his campaign trail in uh -huh. that year, shouting outside post offices. Why? Because the EU were bringing in the Postal Services Directive, which meant that the uh, Royal Mail couldn't be nationalised anymore. It had to be broken up and sold off for parts. All the most money-earning parts of it, which is the business contracts and the big parcel deliveries, got given to private yeah, companies. Yeah. And the Royal Mail were told, right, you've got to just do Mrs Miggins' letters, which doesn't earn them any money. So actually, this problem goes back to guess who? The EU. That doesn't surprise me. I once did a study when I was up in Scotland because the Royal Mail uh, was so slow in getting place, uh, things delivered up and down the, from, say, Scotland to England. And it was apparently quicker when they used to do it on horseback. <laughs> when they did it in, in something like 1911, you could send a, a first-class letter from Edinburgh, you'd give it to a guy literally on a horse, and there would be a series of blokes on horseback who would run it down to London. And you'd get it there basically in about a day and a half. Um, and it now was taking three days. And apparently on first-class stamps, I mean, I don't buy stamps, but they're about 125 now. I know, I know. It's really? unbelievable. I get it, right? Things have changed. People don't post letters as much. But if you're going to impose a solution, then you can't destroy businesses. Yeah, in the, the process. Process. Going to be But terrible. people still post yeah. Christmas cards and birthday cards yeah, and things, they don't do. they? I mean, I don't write letters. Do you write letters? Anybody write letters? Not anymore? really, not my, my post is lovely. He wears shorts all year round. They all do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which is what a post is should do. It's the law. But I very rarely see him. Yeah. Very rarely. Right. Well, the posties are all great people, but they complain that they're being given the wrong things to deliver now because the post office has filled them up with all sorts of, you know, like um, posters that they have to put through letter boxes, direct mail, all this kind of really heavy stuff that they have to carry around. I mean, I don't remember the last thing I got in the post that was of any use, really. Mm, that's what you people know. complain yeah, yeah. about. You know. It's like when you get one part, of the only thing I really get, on, in fact, the, the only thing I get in the post is, is like fines for parking and, and, <laughs> yeah. and bloody, you know, speeding. That's HMRC about it. Are so, in fact, if they do away with the postal service altogether, I won't get them. That would be good. Oh, no. Now, we've got a very interesting, uh, our re incredible research department here at Plank of the Week has found an incredibly interesting um, video of a post office bus. I don't know if you remember this. At Dorking in Surrey, the latest post bus takes to the road. It's the 25th of the line, and by the end of the year, there could be 70. The post office naturally insists the mail must come first, but with the government and local authorities meeting more than half the cost, they see the advantage in taking passengers along too. Who knows, it might even improve the postal service. I mean, I think that's one, that one of those old comma um, vans, wasn't it? This was the idea they had back in, it looks like the early 60s, to, um, to move people around in places which didn't have much public transport. And they thought, well, if you're going to be delivering the post, why don't we do it in a bus? And you can just take people around. Oh. That's the kind of innovation that Britain used to have. Yeah, uh, right? that's what it's actually not a bad idea. Yeah. I mean, there's loads of rural neighbourhoods uh, where there is nothing. You know, I used to live in Wiltshire, a place you know well, um, and there was one bus that went from the town I, I lived in into the main town for people if they wanted to go shopping in the morning and one bus in the afternoon. And that was it. Yeah. You know, so if you missed the 9.30 in the morning, you couldn't go. And yeah. if you missed the 3.30 coming back, you were stuck there. Yeah, I mean, that's oh, just ridiculous. Yeah. But anyway, um, Steve, over to you. Bolton Council. Yes. The whole load of them. Right. This is just, it makes my eyes water. This is outrageous. This mm. is a set of six stunning, huge homes right. that have been demolished because apparently they are two big guys and they're in the wrong place apart but from But they're that, new homes, right? Brand new homes. So they built them. So, yeah, they built them. And now them. they've knocked them down. There have been various kind of to and fro with huh? planning meetings. Somebody somebody bought one of these homes for right. over a million pounds. Right. And they, they, I mean, basically, it's a beautiful area near Lake Windermere. You've right. got kind of, you know, rural farms and fields and now rubble because five out of the six have been demolished, completely demolished. And actually, if you look at these homes, they look, they look beautiful. Right. I mean, we would all quite like to live Who somewhere like this. Who what are they too big for? They were, they were too big, apparently. They're too close to each other. They're in the wrong place. They were built in the wrong <laughs> spots as well. So Apart somebody's that, given a great planning, idea. So somebody's what? given planning permission for these six houses to be built. Yes. But somebody's then misinterpreted it? Or? Over a 20-year period, basically. So it's only recently, in the last right. year, they've started one by one by one 
being demolished. So Bolton Council, what are you doing? That's what ridiculous. are you doing? That is mad, isn't it? The lovely democracy gone mad. Exactly. exactly I mean, what Britain, I was going to say. Could you have something like that going on for 20 years as well? Because surely when yeah. they started building them, someone would have gone, you know, you're building them in the wrong place. Yeah. But nobody did, presumably. No. Or you're building them too big or you're building them too close to each other. But during the building process, building regs and planning come and sign it off right. at various stages. Yeah. But, you know, planning permission is the stranglehold of madness on society and yeah. development, isn't it? I mean, I get some planning permissions needed. You can't just go and whack up a, you know, multi-storey car park in your back garden. But yeah, at the end of the day, the amount of planning permission we've got is why we've got no houses yeah. Yeah. and why people right. like me are going to be 80 living under a motorway bridge surrounded by cats. Yeah. yeah, well, that won't be anybody's fault but your own. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, at the end really. of the day, I mean, people say we haven't got enough houses. Everywhere I go, in certainly South East England, they're building more houses, and I mean, which is also terrifying because they're building more houses to the, by the thousand, but they're not building any more schools, they're not building any more hospitals, they're not building any more doctor surgeries, they're mm. not making the roads any bigger. So it's just going to be complete chaos and nobody's going to be able to get anywhere and or get anything. I'm so glad that I'm a lot closer to death than yeah. I am birth. <laughs> I've started to think that as well about you, Peter. But, I, mean, I, I didn't want to say. <laughs> I said something you want to tell us. <laughs> But, you know, it is ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, the country is going to the dogs. I mean, with more of that later, obviously. But but nobody seems to know how to do anything anymore. I know so many people who've had to move home right. with their parents or yeah. move out of London because right. they can't... Very, very much a London thing. I heard the other day that the average no, price in London of a house now is 750000 no, That's the average. The that average. seems quite cheap. They're, you know, Blimey. honestly, my estate agent messaged me because my rental contract's coming up. you your own estate but, agent? Actually, I'm dating one, basically, but, you know, never mind it. That's how you do um, it. But, uh, but, but, no, not him. He's not, he's not, he's not paying him my rent. Uh, but, uh, no, but they've messaged me saying, oh, we need to put your rent up. I'm like, oh, OK, but, but how much? A £1,000 no, a I mean, month! What? A thousand well, pounds. That can't be right. I'm you, sh like, you should yeah. have you should have some kind of protection. Have you not got one of those, you know, depositors' rights programs? Or something? Oh, I, I, I've got negotiating power apparently. But yeah. I have more respect for somebody who pulls a stocking over their head yeah. and carries a sawed-off yeah, shotgun. Yeah, exactly. Because at least you know they're a robber. Well, as There's you no say, doubt right. about at that. least Dick Turpin wore a mask as they often yeah. say. Well, no, but genuinely, so I know a lot of people who sort of are renting in London, and actually, if you do look at the market value, because I'm like, I'm not staying there a thousand pounds a month more. I'm going to go somewhere yeah, yeah. else. So I went on an undisclosed uh, uh, estate agent app thing to look at properties, and I'm like. Oh, everything's that price, is yeah. it? It's gone up a thousand pounds a month since three years ago. That is actually oh, the normal no, price it's now. Yeah. I mean, it there's is. always it's wild. There's always that viral post that comes up occasionally: a flat in London, a flat, yes, which is often just a cupboard yeah. for yeah, some yeah, yeah. obscene amount of mm. money. Yeah. And you just think, how much longer can this carry on for? I know. And yet, if I took a flight to France, got in a boat, and came over that way, I'd be in a four-star hotel. Make sure you throw your passport away. Yeah, oh, yeah and obviously. your phone. Obviously, yeah. I'm from. I'm but from, not before. You, you go know, though, because in order to Somalia, get in there, can't you tell? I yeah. identify as a Somalian lesbian. And I'm being order... 15. <laughs> yeah, I'm 15 year old Somalian lesbian. We know this uh, show's taken a very strange turn. <laughs> uh, coming up next, Alex Phillips will tell us exactly how she ended up under a motorway uh, with seven cats. That's the story altogether. <laughs> we are going to do more plankery. Uh, I'm going to do an iconic American magazine which has gone completely woke and broke. This is Plank of the Week. Good evening and welcome back to Plank of the Week. I'm Mike Graham and this, of course, is Talk TV. And how better way to spend a Friday night uh, than to watch this? And we will be giving you the winner just before 8 o'clock. But, but right now, it's my turn to suggest my Plank nomination of the week. And it's Sports Illustrated magazine. Now, I don't know how many of you know about Sports Illustrated, but it's an absolutely iconic magazine that uh, everybody... Um, that um, is my age grew up with basically and Very every much. athlete wanted to be on and the every front athlete cover. Wanted, yeah it was started around sort of the 50s I believe and they, the first um, sort of cover was a baseball player and it was the I, it was the sports magazine started by Time Incorporated um, at one point I think it had a circulation of something like three million a week um, uh, or three million a month or whatever it was I mean it was an incredibly um, comprehensive magazine, any sports star that, that was anybody had been on the cover at some point or other. At some point, I think it was in the 70s, they decided it would be a good idea to do um, 
somebody modelling swimsuits down in um, the Caribbean. And then they suddenly came up with the idea of the swimsuit edition, which basically launched a million um, supermodels, like Elle McPherson was on the cover, um, all manner of um, Tyra Banks, all manner of, you know, supermodels during the sort of 80s. And it became a real thing. Um, but just recently, they've had a few problems because they started to change the covers. And would you believe, um, in the last year or so, they've decided to put some trans women on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And I think we've got a couple of them here. Uh, now, this is Lena Bloom, uh, is the woman on the right. And Kim Petras was the one um, most recently at the end of uh, sort of, uh, or sometime around sort of the middle of 2023. Well, wouldn't you know it, um, this sort of followed on from another move that they'd made to try and put some plus size models on the cover. Um, and the plus size model uh, is Yumi Nu. And there she is. Mm. And um, so that was, again, a bit of a wokest move. And the reason that I'm nominating them is that last week, Sports Illustrated announced that they were sacking their entire staff because the circulation has plummeted to such an extent that nobody wants to read it anymore. <laughs> Sports Illustrated is telling the world that true beauty is not about size or shape or the color of your skin, but how confident you are in who you are. Well, I mean, they already had people who had different coloured skin. Tara Banks is a black model. She was on um, for being a supermodel. You know, it wasn't as if this was the first time they'd ever thought of that. How about Yumi Nu? Let's have a look at her. That cover is history. I mean, do you wake up and just say, oh, my gosh. When you look at that, what is that woman saying to the world? I think she's saying that literally anything is possible. Literally I think anything saying, is I possible. English. I think she's saying, I can't actually run very fast, but look at me, I'm on the front of Sports Illustrated. And it may well be history, that cover, but Sports Illustrated is now history as a result of the wokery that has taken over the place. I mean, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know why they disrespect their audiences so much, or the audiences don't matter, and it's all about virtue signalling and maybe chasing a few likes on social media that are empty yeah. and don't yeah. translate into anything. But there, there's something a bit creepy, isn't there? Because let's be fair, the bikini edition of Sports Illustrated is there for men to go, oh, look at you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but it's once a year. Well, no, no, it was I don't mind that. Yeah, men and be it, men. And it, was an, it, was an, it was an absolute no, but the, kind of What I'm going to say is men establishment. be men, be men, which means you're not women. And there's something really creepy about, like, go on then, look at me. Mm -mm, I'm actually a man. Yeah. You know, it's like, come on, that's like gaslighting half the population to go, yeah. Ugh. Yeah. No, don't do that. I know. Yeah. And also, I mean, the, the other problem they had was that they, uh, because of the wokery, uh, they also start, they were accused of writing articles which had been generated by AI. Oh. So, I mean, right. they got it all wrong completely. So the quality just completely plummeted. Mm. They just ruined their product then. Yeah. Uh, they uh, took basically what was overnight. a fantastic, really, really interesting magazine that had some really, really good profiles of people, wrote about all the sports in the world, did some fantastic covers, aside from the model covers, just, just sporting covers, you know. Anybody who was anybody as a photographer wanted to get a cover of Sports Illustrated. I remember years ago, George Michael had loads of supermodels <laughs> yeah. in the video, and they'd all, like, one by one, yeah. appeared in this magazine. Right. It was almost like the place it was. to kind of pop up. And it, it launched made an it. awful lot of, of, of careers as well. But let's have a look at uh, an advert from Sports Illustrated's heyday. The millennium is upon us, but one thing will never change. Guys love girls in bikinis. Travel the globe and see swimsuits, lots of swimsuits. Swimsuits that will make 99 a year to remember. With supermodel host Heidi Klum. I love you. Sports Illustrated Swimsuit 99. The wait is over. Is it a criminal offence if I say I really enjoyed that? Yeah, that's entertainment, <laughs> guys, isn't it? You know, yeah. that's all it is. That's what people yeah. like. You know, and in those days, people watched a lot more TV right. and they read a lot more magazines and they bought stuff that they liked to and look Miss at. Miss Clune didn't look in the slightest bit exploited in any way, shape Not or at all. form. But, but Not what at I all. don't understand in this sort of world now where we have to go, oh, I can't have that, I can't have page three or grid girls anymore, is, oh, it's OK for, like, a five-year-old to watch hardcore porn, though. Well, exactly. That's normal. Yeah, yeah. That's just freedom of That's expression. Fine. And I'm also, like, it's what? no problem at all if you want to bring, um, you know, some kind of drag act into a nursery school and yeah. have the drag act, you know, simulate sex acts for them uh, because they've got to learn sometime after all. I think yeah. that's so true. I think we live in a much more pornified world yeah, than do. I remember yeah. from that era. Exactly. And much more. Like Does that, I mean, you know, you can probably make arguments until the cows come home with all sorts of leftists saying it's obviously pornographic and exploitative. You know, it's just actually people looking at beautiful people and rather enjoying it. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't Not pornographic. Not particularly sexual. 
No. Yeah. Those kind of magazines would have been on the top shelf when I was growing up. Mm. You wouldn't have actually, you know, as a teenager, been able to get hold of those. Right. Whereas now, as you say, it's one click away, isn't yeah. it? If you want to watch well, you should yeah. always get Sports Anything. Illustrated. And Anybody I mean, can get Sports Illustrated. Right, okay. Music videos. Maybe I'll just and, and National yes. Geographic when I was a teenager. I think you're fine. Anyway, um... We're back to where are we? Back to but, you know, it segues <laughs> quite well into my next topic because talking about being a prude, which I am not, I'm just a pragmatist. And I said earlier, men will be men. Well, that's fine. You know, yeah. we all get that. It's called biology. Um, what isn't cool is having a you know big clothing brand advertising little girls in school uniform by showing a sort of little like you know twin pose going turn heads. That is creepy. <laughs> this is H and M. Let's have a look at this. I haven't seen this before. So what is this actually advertising? Well, you know, then? people on Mum's Neck kicked off about this because it's these two girls who, you know, wearing their school uniform. And, yeah, that's just perfectly fine. But did no one in the uh, department were, who came up with the turn heads with your school uniform go, do you not think you're going to be turning the head of Gary Glitter? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, yeah. probably yeah. don't oh. use that as your slogan. No. Yeah. Like, does, does, does no one have any common sense anymore? No. Like, I'm not one no. to sort of get offended or upset right. about, oh, you know. But this is where but, there's this whole double standard, isn't there? Because yeah. we had yes. the double standard with, with was it uh, Calvin Klein underwear, where the woman uh, was, the woman's ad was pulled because uh, it was a, mu a music um, star, I think, uh, because there was a bit too exploitative, it was decided. But there was a guy uh, who was also very sort of underdressed, just wearing his underwear and showing off his body. They were both beautiful, by the way. But his, his advert was allowed to stay up. Hers had to be taken down. Yeah. There was one particularly creepy designer, I can't remember who it is, who had little kids holding all sorts of, like, dodgy... Yeah, well, what dodgy was that? Dodgy yeah. adult toys. Yeah. Yeah. Who it was, was like, it? I can't remember. Wasn't it one of the Italian fashion house? Yeah, yeah. Like, just some sort of it weird, was. Yeah. creepy, fetish. Well, it was like S&M and But this stuff. is it. We're constantly yeah. being told, fetish is good for yeah, you, yeah. it's healthy, yeah. everyone's got to have a fetish, tie each other up, slap each other, spit on each other. If you're not doing that, you're not normal. Mm. Then it's like, but no, page three. No. Yes, exactly. It's really messed up. We're not it having is. the important debates because we're wasting our time putting trans people right. on Sports Illustrated. And has H&M uh, done anything about this or are they still... Um, yeah, no, they've pulled the ad. They've pulled I mean, the good. They, they probably needed to. Um, but there's, I mean, there, there is something very, very wrong and very off I about mean, life now. those are little girls. I mean, innocent little girls. But it is weird, isn't it, how the thought processes of some of these marketing people must work? Because you would think at some point surely in that process somebody would go don't you think we'll get some some uh, some kicking for this don't there, you think there would have been whole whole kind of boardroom meetings you would have thought yeah, but they were... nobody stepped in and said hang on a minute <laughs> Let's... But they're probably all, you know, bespectacled guys of a certain age who don't wear socks with their loafers <laughs> and are more used to search terms on adult websites than what it is to be a parent. That's mm. the problem that's with so advertising true. agencies. I think that's yeah. so true. It's I think... a very weird thing. Yeah. Anyway, Peter, over to you. Uh, you've gone back to the world of politics for us. I am. Yes. And uh, this week's nomination is Absana Begum, yes. MP. London MP. Yep, Tower Hamlets. Tower Hamlets, yeah. Yep. I know it well. I drive through it on a regular basis. Poplar. <laughs> the other yeah. independent republic. Yeah, I do. It's right on the other side of Rotherhithe Tunnel. It's where they had the biggest Palestinian, uh, pro-Palestinian <coughs> demonstration, which was sort of unofficial. Blocked all traffic for one entire Sunday night. This was a few months ago. Uh, similarly, also did one in Limehouse Link Tunnel. It's all her constituency. Yeah, and Miss Bacon is a friend of Comrade, what's his name, Corbyn. Corbyn, of course she is. Yeah, that's yeah. an old mucker of his. Yes, yeah, yeah. of the Tezza. You know, and so she's a... Proper socialists, yeah, we think. We think, yeah. And of course, if she's a proper socialist, yeah, then she would, of course, feel for those less fortunate than herself. Of course, she I'm would, sure, yeah, definitely and have a lot of empathy yes. for them. But she's currently living in a council house or flat, I should say, no. which is valued at about three hundred and sixty grand, Riverside, near her constituency. But she enjoys all the benefits of living in. Social housing yes. provided by the local council. How does she get that? When she's earning eighty-six thousand pound a year mm. as an MP, and she gets a four grand uplift because she's a London MP. Now, when she got that flat, mm. she was she had some other role, and she was on about thirty. Oh, she wasn't an year. MP then. Yeah, right. so I've not got so much of a gripe about that. Even so, has she got. I mean, maybe she got kids or something. It's quite hard to get a council flat in London, isn't it? Yeah, but surely now that she's trousering ninety grand. Mm you would think maybe she'll step and aside from this property and let somebody else who's less fortunate yeah. than herself occupy it. I mean, maybe she's saving up to be a socialist. Maybe. Because <laughs> let's face it, right, the Guardian is three quid a day. 
That's very easy. expensive, right? <laughs> yeah. Champagne. I'm yeah. sure Miss Bacon doesn't drink champagne. No, because she's a Muslim, she may not drink. But we all know of champagne socialists. Yeah. Seen the price of champagne lately. I know, that's gone through the roof. And I went on to an online retailer mm. and a Palestinian flag has set you back five quid. So, it... so being a socialist... That's the business to be in, isn't it? It's expensive. <laughs> it is expensive. Uh, and she's also said, apparently, in a recent interview that she doesn't know why she still lives there. Well, I do, because it's cheap. There yeah. you go. But now, Tower Hamlets is the worst, though. Like, it's got the most social um, shortages yeah. of social Well, housing. Tower Hamlets has got quite a few problems, but, but let's have a look at her at Sama Begum talking about benefits. My constituency has one of the highest rates of child poverty in the entire country, with too many already struggling between heating and eating. The government's recent real terms social security cut will now push even more families, children and pensioners into desperation. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we know where we can send them if they get desperate for anything. Just go round to Absama Begum's gaff and see if she's got anything. I should you. have found out if she's got any spare rooms. She, she might have. Yeah, Forgive she me might for have. That. No, not to worry. We'll check it out. Uh, Peter Bletchley, thank you very much. Coming up next, uh, we've got some more planks. We're going to go over to Canada. Uh, we're going to go to um, some part of the south of England and also um, one of our favourites from Labour. Uh, this is Plank of the Week. Welcome back to Plank of the Week. It's Friday night right here on Talk TV. I'm Mike Graham and we are well into uh, this week's nominations. We've got Candice Holdsworth here. Uh, let's go over to uh, Ontario. Yes, yeah, so it's the Ontario Court of Appeal, but really it's about Jordan Peterson. Yeah. So it's a big story this week that Jordan Peterson is being forced to undergo mandatory social media training <laughs> by the board of psychologists who've taken it all the way up to the Inter Ontario Court of Appeal. Yeah. And they've won. They've said, no, they have the power to do this right. as his professional body. And Jordan, Jordan Peterson is originally from Canada. I, mean, yeah. does he still, I don't think he still lives in Canada, does he? I think, I think he does, he but I'm not do, yeah. sure. He but travels around a lot. I mean, he does. for people who haven't heard of Jordan Peterson, I know there won't be many of them. I mean, he's a professor originally by trade, isn't he? But he started to write books and he became the darling of, of young men in particular. Yes. Uh, he's a guy who um, talks about sort of being libertarian and freedom of speech is everything yeah. to him, right? He's an incredibly original thinker. He is. He's amazing. I mean, he's a cultural phenomenon. And you just <laughs> look at this board of psychologists that are basically I mean, trying to take him down. And they're just Lilliputians mm. trying to take down Gulliver. I mean, in this most banal, bureaucratic way. Yeah. And he did an interview with his daughter saying that he thinks this could be the beginning of him losing his license right. as a psychologist. Yes. I mean, he's got a lot of other things going on. But this is incredibly authoritarian and censorious. Yeah. He hasn't broken any rules. Right. They just don't like the opinions he's expressed on social media. Yes. I mean, it's about, you know, like Sports Illustrated, right. for instance. Yeah, well, so is this coming from his professional body, is it? Yes, whatever? yeah, the board certified. So it's a certified. bit like being done over um, by the BMA, isn't it, if you were working yes. and living in London? Exactly. Uh, or in some part of Britain, and they didn't like what you were putting out on social media because yes. it might be a bit right-wing. Yes, exactly. I mean, he hasn't broken any rules. Um as far as we know. And the thing is, yes, the court can rule that they have the power to do this, and they do have the power to do this, possibly legally, but it should never have got that far. But I of wonder course, what's, I wonder what's, a court mm. can compel someone to have compulsory social media training. What is that, anyway? What is social media training? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, what do we roll for? I can train some people in social media. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know. Canada's gone mad, hasn't it? Oh, it Canada has. is the sort of uh, HQ of the worst Canada has robbery. gone mad, under, under our friend doing... Mr Trudeau. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's got yeah. a nice butt, that guy, but well, nothing else going for him. Well, the only other thing but... you know about him is he, he, he likes to dress up in blackface. No, he, he did he used to, to like parties. a bit of that. Yeah, he did that a lot. Yeah, he did yeah. used to like a bit of that. Before he became woke, obviously. We had that whole truckers thing in Canada. Do you remember when he's like, truckers must be vaccinated? They've also got a euthanasia policy, which means they can just bump off anybody if they so fancy it. I mean, they've taken to be honest, euthanasia if you lived in Canada, to the you'd probably degree. volunteer. I mean, it's and quite a dull place. The trans awful, thing is off know. the chain in Canada. You and have to have, like, you know, your gender and your passport, and you can have X and your right. pronouns. I, I mean, haven't been there for it. many years, but I used to go there quite a lot when I lived in New York. And Ottawa is possibly one of the worst and most boring cities I think I've ever been to <laughs> in my life. There's nothing to do there at yes, all. Yes, the land. And that's where the capital... Is that why so many people are just getting that's, bumped off with you? Well, yeah, probably, they probably... No, I was saying they probably Dead. volunteer. But, you know, <laughs> it snowed when I was there once and it came down about seven feet overnight, something like that. It was, that was ridiculous. You couldn't do anything. And it's the home of their government. So it's no wonder that they come up with all these crazy notions. They but have. What, what would social media training be? 
I have no idea. I mean, he kind of is looking at it as a bit of a joke. He's already started mocking it. I'm sure he it. doesn't care. I mean, he can fill theatres around the world. Of course he can. Notice. Does it involve, what? like, electrodes stuck to your head? <laughs> 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 There's a bubble. Re-education. <laughs> he can have like, Chinese friends back from St Pancras to do it. Yeah. yeah. You know, you exactly. can't take any pictures of it either <laughs> while you're at it. Um, Steve. You've got uh, a Tory MP. I can't stop talking about this story. Okay. I think it might this be... This is a new one on me, so do tell me. I think this might be the worst interview of the year so far. Really? Maybe, maybe the year, actually. <laughs> this is the car crash interview mm. uh, the other morning on Breakfast TV. So it started with Culture Secretary Lucy Fraser yes. calling the BBC biased. Right. So step forward Hugh Merriman, mm. who went on BBC TV, right. didn't know... I mean, he, he was claiming that he was listening to a BBC comedy... And then, couldn't remember the name of the show. This was the problem, wasn't it? Because Lucy Fraser was the same. People kept saying to her, well, Give us what examples. exactly do you think is biased? And she kept saying... And I mean, there's plenty of examples. We talk about it all the time. But they didn't seem to have any. No. And it was ridiculous. So, see, he's struggling live on TV, and he said, I'll tell you what, I heard this comedy show, but it might have not been a comedy show. And then, he, and then bizarrely, and this is the really bizarre bit, he name-drops... Neil Buchanan. Now, right. people of a certain age watching talk TV tonight will remember Neil. He was a presenter. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is ridiculous. He was a presenter of Art Attack right. on ITV. Right. Like, you, know, you wouldn't even be able to call it that you, now, would you? Well, no, <laughs> indeed. He's, he's certainly never done a show on BBC and he's just the purest, kind of nicest, right. kindest kids' TV presenter right. who would never say boo to a goose. Mm, right. So he's been... Uh, in actual fact, I think Hugh meant the, uh, the BBC social affairs correspondent, Michael. Buchanan, not Neil Buchanan. Easy mistake to make. But Neil Buchanan's had a new lease of life right. thanks to this disaster. No, because everybody thinks now he's a great guy. Well, let's have a look. Here's Hugh Merriman talking to Kay Burley. You must have got specific examples of when BBC News has been biased. Give me one. So when I worked at the Department for Work and Pensions and I was working on universal credit, uh, there was an individual there who would report on it, Neil Buchanan, who I always felt gave one side of the story and not the other side, which was the government side that I was working really hard on because I believed in universal credit. So that would be my working example when I work there. We have some substance that we can now go back to them on. So, should we have a look at Neil... Yeah. Should we have a look at what Neil Buchanan actually did? <laughs> Hello there. Good to see you again. <laughs> Sorry about that. You just caught me having my dinner. Oh! <laughs> Good joke, eh? <laughs> make someone believe you've dropped your dinner. Want to make one? Come and have a look at this. Doesn't seem to be anti Tory to me. I'll tell you what, though, <laughs> there's, there's, there's yeah. something that very few people know about this series, Go right? On. And I'm going to give you the truth you bomb this? right now. I remember, I grew up with that. Yeah. Uh, that innocent art attack series. You know that weird head they used to have, that plasticine head that spoke? If you look in the hairline, the hairs actually spell out the word sex. <gasps> the oh. head, Alex. Yeah, I'm my telling God. you, my childhood the gone. head, the head is uh, goodness me, the head in more ways well, than one. Very, I think that's biased against people who but, do I mean, genuinely spill their dinner. The thing that's actually <laughs> shocking about this, and, and you're quite right to point it out, Steve, is, yeah. is that any Tory minister would go on an interview about why the BBC is biased and it must be stopped without any idea of any examples that they could actually say, oh, well, here's one, here's yeah. two, here's three. You know, just go fine. We have all that. got a but, list of stuff. We're not but hold on. Know. Maybe Plank of the Week should actually be the CCHQ press office because they've made Rishi Sunak do that mad AI thing as well. It's like, you know, <laughs> hello, yeah. Alex. Uh, what was that all about? Consumer. I heard you guys doing I mean, that this basically, week. the whole of CCHQ have just gone into meltdown. I don't know who's working there, <laughs> but clearly nobody... I think, they're all, I think they're all taking acid or something. You're just <laughs> no. kind of, you know, coming in the morning and going, what should we do today? They found you a know. leftover Prosecco from Boris's COVID yeah. party. I mean, yeah. it really is incredible because I mean, because Lucy Fraser. I watched Lucy Fraser being interviewed uh, by Jeremy Carl actually on, on Talk Today, and they asked her something about something completely different. And I think it was about um, schools and whether or not you know schoolboys and girls should be called schoolboys and girls. And she kind of froze like a oh, rabbit in the headlights. Dear. Didn't know how to answer it. Wasn't sure what to say. It was kind of like taken aback that you'd go on a television show and be asked a question that they didn't say they were going to ask. Yes, so ill-suited for these times, I think, and that's yeah. why they're doing so badly. Right. I mean, do you remember during the whole? I mean, um, the others aren't much better. I mean, no. I don't think there's any politicians uh, now that can appear and be just able to riff about almost any subject. You know, yes. the way we have to do. Yeah. Well, Gillian Keegan, when she had that kind of little meltdown when yeah. she was asked about the crumbling concrete. Yeah, yeah. And you could see she wanted people to feel sorry for her. Right. It's just like, no. No, that's your job. Yes. That's why you get paid quite well. And if you don't like it, you can just resign. Why don't you? Not <laughs> difficult. <laughs> I should give an honorary mention, by the way, because they haven't made it in this week. They normally do make it in. Um, the Tory party this week are, are sort of so plankish that they're kind of off the scale. They need a show of their own. 
you know, because we had this guy, Simon Clark, deciding to write a piece in The Telegraph saying that Rishi Sunak should go. And then immediately, everybody rallied behind Rishi Sunak. And this guy, who presumably thought that wouldn't happen, uh, was sort of left out in the cold. I did think about nominating Simon Clark, but I mean... Oh, no, you end, should have done Rishi based on those creepy but we've, we've videos been, No, but alone. we've been doing the, the Tories literally all week. You know, for those people who say to me, you never ever go to the Tories. I mean, we're literally they're on Plank of the Week every week at the moment because yeah. they're so Plankish. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's the end of that. Luckily, though, for balance, uh, coming up next, we're going to do the head of the Labour Party. This is Plank of the Week. <laughs> <laughs>Welcome back to Plank of the Week. We are getting into the final part of the show. I've got one more nomination to go, and then, of course, uh, we're going to be telling you who is the winner. But, Peter Blexley, before we do anything, I should remind people that they can catch up with your crime suspect show um, on YouTube, can't they? It appears over the course of the weekend on the channel here as well on Talk TV, but find it on YouTube. It's all about um, crime, isn't it? It does. Crime, policing, the big stories of yeah. the week, and there's yeah. always plenty of those. There's no shortage of crime. Brilliant panellists, and I'm very fortunate just to host it. Excellent. Good stuff. Well, we'll carry on with, uh, with Plank of the Week. As I was saying, the Tories were uh, almost ridiculous this week, but uh, so was Keir Starmer, which is really unfortunate for him because he's got an open door. They keep making the most ridiculous mistakes, but he then makes even more mistakes. And instead of fighting the Tory party on things that you might think were important to people in this country, he decided to have a go at them over wokery. Mm. But he didn't say anything that was in any way actually important. He said he was going to make this very, very important speech. Let's have a bit of a look at what he had to say this week. In its desperation to cling on to power at all costs, the Tory party is undertaking a kind of weird McCarthyism, trying to find woke agendas in the very civic institutions they once regarded with respect. Let me tell you, Waging a war on the proud spirit of service in this country isn't leadership. It's desperate. It's divisive. It's damaging. And it comes to something when the Tories are at war with the National Trust. So basically, Keir Starmer's theory um, is that wokeism is all made up by the Tories, that it doesn't actually exist. And the only reason that the Tories are telling you it exists is because they want to have a culture war uh, with all the decent people in the country who think everything's fine. Sakir Thatcher, uh, Starmer. <laughs> uh, so sometimes it's just easy to confusing. forget. It's, it's confusing. Um, he totally lost the plot on this one. Yeah. Of all the things that are crumbling, right. of all the things that don't work, of all the difficulties that people are of facing. All the diversity, all yeah. of the equity, you know, all of the you know inclusivity that we get from the NHS, from the police. Yeah. Um, mm. We know who prefer to have rainbow flags on their on their police cars than actually um, uh, bother to, to, to arrest anybody. He then said that the, the, the Tories had somehow in, 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 uh, made the British public hate the RNLI and the National Trust. Well, people don't hate the National Trust, but there are people who are members of the National Trust who are worried about how woke it's become. Yeah. For example, they put out a calendar that didn't have Christmas in it, but it had mm. Eid uh, and it had Diwali and it had all sorts of other um, festivals from different religions, but didn't have Christmas in it. Yeah, I mean, the problem is with institutions like the National Trust and the RNLI, they are essentially publicly funded because they provide a very important role. And yeah. RNLI is there to save lives at sea. It's a charity. It doesn't get government money. And we're an island, so obviously we need this service uh, incredibly. And it's all volunteers, and they're very brave men and women who sign up to do that service. The National Trust is there to secure our heritage. Now, both of them are being abused and misused for other purposes. Yeah. The National Trust, in terms of actually completely whitewashing our history, and saying, yeah. It's all terrible. It's all colonialism. Right. It all needs a trigger warning and everyone's got to wear and lots a of rainbow some, coloured lanyard. And of what they say is actually incorrect. Well, yeah. Well, they, everyone is gay, according to the National yeah. Trust now. Even if they died 700 years ago and were married with five children, probably yeah. gay. Right. Um, but then the RNLI as well is increasingly being called upon mm. to go and get people who are trying to enter the country illegally. Right. And also so get the them from French water. They go to French waters to rescue people right. who are not sinking. Yeah. I'm sorry, Starmer that's not what the RNLI is meant to do. So if somebody sees that yeah. and they then go onto social media and say, I'm very disappointed with the RNLI, yeah. I'm not going to donate to right. them anymore, they're suddenly branded mm. as something that Evil. they're not. Evil mm. Tories, because they, they basically, Keir Starmer's um, sort of shtick here uh, is that you must be some kind of horrible, ghastly, divisive individual if you criticise any of these organisations. And I spy something going on here, because this is the same guy who says you shouldn't criticise the NHS, 
And now you shouldn't criticise the RNLI. And now you know, next it will be you shouldn't criticise the police. I mean, and the Labour Party will be ridiculously bad in government because they will probably make it a crime. You know, to actually be critical of any of these they people. They are so out of touch and they are only benefiting from the fact that the Conservatives are imploding. Mm -hmm. They have no alternative agenda. They're not offering anything to the public, but they can just stand back and do nothing. Yeah. And Sir Keir Starmer doesn't seem to... I always like to make sure he's called Sir Keir Starmer yes, because he likes must. to seem to drop that honour, I think. Oh, he doesn't like people. it, does he? But he doesn't understand that there is such thing as the internet because he flew over to Canada, didn't he? And then yeah. he said over there, oh, we're going to rejoin the EU. <laughs> he was going to get back to us, did he? Yeah. <laughs> no, he also took a private jet to Qatar, didn't he, when he was over doing COP28 um, because he thought he had to have a meeting. But it's not a good idea for Rishi Sunak to do it. Anyway, uh, we've come to the end of the show, ladies and gentlemen. All I've got to do now uh, is award the plank of the week. And I think it's been a brilliant show. I think there's been so many really, really unusual nominations. But I think, given what we've just watched, I think it's got to be Hugh Merriman. Because Hugh Merriman is the biggest plank that I think I've ever seen. Poor you know, Neil to, Buchanan. To misname <laughs> poor old Neil Buchanan, <laughs> who's, I mean, whether he had sex across his forehead or not, I mean, <laughs> he's obviously Buchanan, renowned for being a children's, <laughs> uh, my a, children's, a children's TV presenter. I mean, Mr Merriman, absolute plank. Uh, well done. Uh, Lisa Ooh, Tories have won it again this week. Thank you very much to Alex. Thank you very much to Peter. Thank you to Candice. Thank you to Steve Denyer uh, from Virgin Radio. We'll be back, of course, same time next week. And I'll be back at 11.30 tonight the world, according to Mike Gray.